And now, a native podcast with Matt and Zach. And welcome back to another a native podcast episode with Matt and Zach. Uh, I am Zach, and with me as always is Matt. And I got I got to start it off that way as always, Matt. I got to say, Matt, buddy, how you doing? <laughs> I'm doing pretty good, my man. Um, yeah, just uh, excited to be back on here and uh, talking about more native stuff. Right? No, it's always fun and exciting. You know, we kind of we we take our days off, our breaks off, with, with in between this, I know we have conversations in between the episodes. You know, kind of yeah. when we record them about different things and what topics we may use, etc. Mm -hmm. but it's definitely it's super exciting uh today you know we're doing another treaty episode if you haven't read the title um this is another treaties one um which is exciting you know we do the tribes we do the treaties um we almost need a third one maybe teepees no i don't know (laughs) (laughs) true tribes treaties and some housing (laughs) housing structures (laughs) yeah exactly no but it's good it's all good we got we got a good one lined up for you today. Um, I don't know, Matt. Matt, usually you have something to get us started. You know, you yeah. know it's not like jumping jacks. It's just a little story. Uh, what, what what do you got? Yeah, yeah. Today I had um, kind of in made big news was uh, the uh, that high school native girl in New Mexico, in Farmington, New Mexico, Farmington High School. She's a Lakota had her eagle feather, eagle plume, and her uh, cap, her graduation cap, t- removed from her before graduation ceremony. And that made a lot of headlines, you know. I, so, I'm glad it made headlines. I mean, I'm, I'm disappointed in when you look at certain states, such as New Mexico, uh, Montana, mm-hmm. You know, when you look like out west where they have higher populations of native folk. And and they do have policies. Like New Mexico is very pro-policy natives in different ways. But it's like, how how do you not have this graduation stuff? Why can't, you know, why 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 in far in Farmington's not far from the Navajo? I mean, and and I wonder, I what I'm wondering about this incident is like you have you seen all the other native kids there at around her. Like there's a lot of Navajos specifically. Right. But they don't, I feel like they they might be wearing more like wristbands and turquoise and so or underneath the grad like grad right. you see that stuff. Right. Whereas yeah. like if you're from a plains tribe like this girl, then like it's more of the feathers and the Navajos, I mean, I don't want to misspeak, but maybe it's like they don't do the feathers on the caps as much. Right. So this girl might have been targeted because it's like she's not from a tribe from there right something different you know what i mean like there's that that went through my mind a little bit too so no that makes sense and for you to have that thought right you're you're looking at it from your lakota perspective as yeah, well exactly um, or any I, plains tribe that the eagle feathers yeah. mean, you know so oh well, yeah and the eagle is a very sacred bird to a lot of tribes many tribes mm-hmm. um for that matter um I yeah I I don't know Farmington it's it's off reservation though so that's part of it too right so it, it is like that's what I'm saying state of New Mexico right white school district that kind of bullshit too well and, it's probably one of those like racist border towns that you hear it it, it is actually you know Gallup Farmington oh, yeah. um what is it in Mon I mean Montana Billings and I mean, <laughs> I'm just throwing some shade at Billings. Yeah, no, you're not wrong. Kalispell, Rapid City, Bismarck. We, we, all, of we... Them. <laughs> all of them. Line them up. No, like Glasgow, even here, like compared to Wolf Point, like yeah. Glasgow. Oh, yeah. You, you, you see it. And it's sad that you still see it. Was it Haver and Cut Bank? I've heard some things too up there. Like, <laughs> fucking yeah. suck it's it sucks that it exists because it's like dude people are people let them be like you're going right. to get lazy folk regardless of color of their skin you're going to get people who you want to work with regardless of who they are you know it's like you can't control who you are like you can control who you are but not like who, not race not like your, yeah you're you're from like, skin like, color <laughs> yeah exactly how you're yeah. up how you're brought up you know mm-hmm. so that's the thing you just can't judge you know you can't you just got to let people be um, but no, that's not what we're here to talk about today. 
um, we are here to talk to you about the Middle Organ Treaty of 1855. Um, for thousands of years, Native peoples of various tribes resided in what the 1850s was known as the Oregon Territory. Their cultures were closely tied to the land, its waters, and then many forms of life it supported. In 1846, the Oregon Treaty signed by the United States and the United Kingdom settled the northwest border between the United States and Canada. More importantly, it set the stage for thousands of American settlers to swarm over what had been Indian land. In 1853, Joel Palmer, the, in, the Bureau of Indian Affairs Superintendent for the Oregon Territory, negotiated a series of treaties with tribes of the Northwest to obtain much of their land and force them onto reservations. Under the provisions of the 1855 Middle Oregon Treaty, the tribe ceded 10 million acres to the United States and 578,000 acres were reserved for what became the Confederate tribes of the Warm Spring Reservation. The Columbia River soon became a major west east-west route for settlers and others traveling to the Pacific Northwest region. The land re reserved at Warm Springs was a remote corner of the territory one Wasco elder told Palmer, the place you have mentioned, I have not seen. There are no Indians or whites there yet. And that is the reason I say, I know nothing about that country. If there were whites and Indians there, then I would think it was a good country. Mm -hmm. Today, there are 574, they have 73, let me update this, this is 2018. Uh, Native American tribes officially recognized by the United States government, ranging from tribes with less than 100 members to some with hundreds of thousands. In June of this year, I believe this was written in 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, this is this is from the National Archives. Um, in June, the National Archives loaned the original Navajo Treaty of 1868 to the Navajo Nation Museum. The Navajo Nation comprises about 400,000 members and is arguably the largest group of Native people in the United States. I say that number is closer to a million nowadays. I, uh, yeah. Especially if you count people who are net, like mixed. I think that's the full blood. Oh, yeah. Thousands full, full blood. I think that's it. Uh, more recently, we loaned the Middle Oregon Treaty to the museum at Warm Springs. About 5,000 from the Wasco, Warm Springs, and Paiute tribes live on the reservation in Eastern Oregon. Mm -hmm. uh, the Paiutes joined the reservation several decades after the treaty was signed. Right. Uh, a quote from, or in January this year, we received a loan request from the museum at Warm Springs to feature the original 1855 Middle Oregon Treaty. In October 2018, as part of the Memory of the Land exhibition in her request, the museum's executive director, Carol Leone, wrote, the museum at Warm Springs exists as an answer to a question that has troubled Native Americans in general and the Confederate tribes at Warm Springs in particular. Uh, for the most of the past century, can this nation's indigenous peoples take meaningful steps on their own initiative, under their own control, to halt the erosion of their traditions, the disparal of their sacred artifacts and loss of their very very identify as culture. I don't know. That that's weird. That was weird. Very identify as culture. After 25 years, the answer to this question is decidedly yes. In months that followed, many emails, multiple phone calls were necessary to explain NARA's loan request requirements and to work out logical, logistical details for transport installation and security. The museum partnered with the High Desert Museum in Bend, Oregon about an hour away to fabricate a new exhibit case to NARA specifications. The museum's archivist, Eveline Pat, selected six pages of the treaty to be displayed, including the signature pages. In late September, on a sunny, cool, crisp morning, Carol met NARA con conservator Beatriz Centeno and I at our hotel in Madras. We drove to the museum where we, dis where we too discussed the plans for the installation of the treaty. Klaus Koch from Security Pros joined us to review security protocols while the treaty was on site. 
Later that morning, Gus Bradley and Cindy Bradley from the High Desert Museum joined us. Gus and his colleague, Dustin Cockerham, had fabricated the case and bend. Our greatest challenge was low relative humidity with the very helpful museum staff. We were able to have the relative humidity in the gallery raised up to an acceptable and sustainable level. In weeks that followed, regular reports showed that the environmental inside the case was being maintained within NARA's specific, specified limits. When all was ready, National Archives conservator Beatrice Centeno carefully placed each of the six pages into the case. After taking some time to obtain balanced light levels, everyone agreed that the case could be closed. With our mission completed, Carol took us on a driving tour of the high desert and we rode out to the Deschutes River Dam. On our way back to the airport in Portland, we traveled through the Cascade Mountains and had a great view of the majestic Mount Hood. Meanwhile, the museum hosted a prayer service to bless the arrival of the treaty. Um, on October 27th of 2018, the museum at Warren Springs hosted a treaty conference where the Living Treasures awarded Living Treasures Awards were presented to Redline Billy, Geraldine Jim Foster, Kalma nu Kanu, Arita Rohan, and Maxine Schweitzer. Schweitzer. Uh, we are most grateful to Executive Director Carol Leon and her talented staff, especially Natalie Kirk, Sunmate Mabin, and Joseph Brisbois, for their warm welcome and helping make this installation go smoothly. Dana Whitelaw, Director Dustin Cockerham, Head Preparator Gus Bradley, Assistant Preparator and Sydney Bradley, Director of Exhibits at the High Desert Museum, provided invaluable assistance that helped make the treaty display possible. Back home at the National Archives, Patrick Kepley, Jane Fitzgerald, Michael Hussey, Beatrice Centeno, and Abigail Aldrich helped with the, all the essential preparations behind the scenes. Um, and this was written by Jesse Kratz in December of 2018. Yeah, and it's interesting that how these tribes get loaned their original treaties when it's like that's theirs that's their document for the museum <laughs> right um and 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 well it sounds like there's a museum that's the high desert museum so it might not be a tribal museum oh 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 right right yeah. but uh, the warm museum at warm springs highly highly recommend that one they um they really do a good job of highlighting their culture and what right. happened. You know, I've been to several tribal museums and, and we can talk more about this when we get my buddy Joseph on here, yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, he, that one and Umatilla are really good ones in Oregon. Now, now Grand Ronde has one and they're doing a pretty good job with it too. So. Oh, exactly. You know, telling their story. Oh, exactly. As, as we should, as we have the right to. Um, um yeah, go ahead. I'll let you go ahead. Yeah, I got, so I don't know which one you want to see first. Maybe uh, I could talk about the actual tree with the different bands here. Oh, go for it. Okay. And I also have a map and maybe I can just show that after toward the end. No, so go ahead. Can... You can pull it up if you want and talk, okay. about it and talk about the different tribes. Yeah. Okay. Let's, uh, let me get this here on share screen. Oh, you gotta, you gotta allow me to share it looks like go ahead okay okay so we got this one's a really good one because it shows the entire state of oregon and how like the territory was like you know you can see like the umatilla reservation today the warm springs reservation today and just how much territory got shrunken down um yeah, because so, you don't have a coast reservation or the Malheur reservation, huh? No, no. So the Malheur reservation wow. is what turned into the tiny, tiny little Burns Paiute tribe today, which is like maybe four to five hundred people um in the town of Burns there. Wow. And then Shoshone Bannock, I mean, there's there's the Fort McDermott tribes, which part of their reservation goes into Oregon, but their headquarters are on the Nevada side. So they count as a Nevada tribe. Right. Um, and then the coast ones are just kind of a cluster, um, which, you know, when we talk to Joseph more about Grand Ronde, we can talk about how they're, you know, more interior people and Celets is more the coast kind of people. Right. 
um, interior Willamette Valley, Umpqua Valley, Rogue Valley is Grand Ronde, basically. That's a really good map. Oh, it's great. This is so this is from my old professor, David Lewis. Send who, that to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it really shows Oregon well. And so get this. I want to highlight this really quick. The far northwest corner of Oregon, there's no treaty with those tribes. And guess what? Today, that is the Confederated Tribes of Clatsop Nehalem, those two tribes in that area. And they are not federally recognized. Huh. I they're wonder state, why. They're state recognized. And it's funny because that's the area where Lewis and Clark, the Clatsop, are the people they stayed with there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and and so, that's the thing. It's like they, people forget that. Like they stayed with people there. They right. They stayed with people in Mandan. Mm -hmm. They stayed. Stayed with people when they're down in Dillon, Montana, on the Beaverhead River, you know, <laughs> or you know, like Big Hole River. Fuck it, right. uh, it bugs me. It bugs it's... me. They think they just like explored unknown territory. I mean, in a way, it was unknown to them, but and to the America at that time, but still, like, right. Um. So with the Warm Springs tribes today in the Middle Oregon Treaty, um, the town of Wasco. Do you see my little cursor there? Oh yeah. Okay, so see the, Dow the Dalles there. There's the Dalles. And then up here on a little plateau is the town of Wasco. If you drive up, up and then up this other road, it sits right there. That's where they signed the treaty. Um, and Warm Springs tribes are Wasco, Warm Springs, or they call, they say Tenino a lot. And they were, the, they were that. along the, yeah, you've heard that. Yeah, they live, they lived along the river. And in this area, whereas like down in the desert areas was the northern Paiute. And they got, like you were reading earlier, they got moved to the reservation after the Warm Springs and Wascos got moved there. Well, when you show, right, when you show this, it makes sense. Because that's where like they would, that's where they lived. Yeah, because the northern Paiutes were like as far north as where these mountains started south. Like they were a desert, southeast Oregon Paiute. Right. Shoshone Bannock a little bit out here, but Paiutes were all of this desert. Um where's so yeah. Bend in 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 relation to all this? Where's Bend? <laughs> so here's Pineville. Bend is about right here in the uh almost the center of the state, but more a little more on the west. Huh. Interesting that the reservation, when they shrunk it down from the original treaty, places like Bend, Oregon. Bend, Oregon and off. Bend they moved them the two tribes away from the river also um lifeblood because it was the lifeblood it was the salmon and have if you watch there's a documentary i i don't know if it's artificial or a different salmon one that patagonia does they do a few it's oh. like three, but they show the waterfall there that was at the dalles in oregon and the oh, tribal wow. members it interviewed do not like the fact that they just dammed up the columbia river it no. was never supposed to happen and it was just something that you know oregon and the oregon way you know at that time wow. was like nah we're taking everything from these people we're cutting their life but same way of taking the bison off the plains right like exactly. we're going to cut off the salmon we're going to cut you from your water we're going to put you in the desert Right. No. And, and that's the thing is like, th so this was the treaty that, you know, on the Oregon side of the river, right? Because the other side was Yakima and we'll talk about that treaty another time. But this one took out the falls and the access for the Warm Springs bands and Wasps that lived along there. And it's it, it in that Columbia River was like a huge highway, too you know, for transportation. And now, you know, you and I have driven Interstate 84 along there enough to know that like now the tribes are on both sides are buying or getting land back. Yeah, but it it's not the same. And no, you know, no, it, it's no. good to it's good to see, but like like you're saying, like you do see some of the old fishing like where mm -hmm. they would stand out and fish. Right. Uh, and they, they are getting some of that back and some of them there are building new ones i have actually i've seen some videos where like they've built like new fishing platforms for right uh their fishermen on the river but yeah like the dowels you take places like dowels like that should be that should be the reservation that should be warm springs reservation right there mm -hmm. right on the river where they where they were living 
Yep. You know, the, the majority. Um, and then today they just have, uh, they do have Salilo Village, which is just east of the Dalles there. And that that is like, you know, there's groups that live all from Cascade Locks over. There's natives that live along there and they just live in trailers. But for some reason, Salilo Village, and maybe because they resisted and fought more or something, that they were able to get some housing there in that small community. Um, they have a longhouse there. They have a salmon bake like this time of year. So salmon ceremony. Um, yeah. So it's really, really fascinating stuff. But but you pointed out something with Bend and just the wealth there. Well, uh, you haven't really gone over there, spent a lot of time, but like it is that upper part of those rivers where it's just beautiful and like lush and it's some greenery right where the mountains meet the desert. And it's just a just i see why it became what it became oh yeah no i um, i it's I get it. it's just but yeah those people all live through there in those <laughs> you know those beautiful areas and and we have the you know you have these luxury resorts along the river like sun river you know the deschutes river starts up here and flows north all the way right no exactly um, and then I mean, it's good to see warm springs is putting in their new resort right still like it's not comparable comparable to what it what what it could be where it could be right like right. that's part, that's part of it like people aren't going to drive to some of these reservations just because of where they're located you know no, yeah. and that resort is not right there in warm springs where the highway comes you have to drive some other road up like out to another almost in nashville which is another another community on that reservation interesting yeah, and it's, and it's, it's just, a small river, too, called the Warm Springs River, which flows into the Deschutes off the Cascades. Nice little river, but it's it's tiny. Like, I don't even know if too many salmon go up it because <laughs> it's right. small, you know? Yeah, when you look at the bigger picture of what, what was had, when you look at, like, the, I really like this. It shows the watershed. On yeah. This, this is a really, really good map. You no, know, it's interesting. And it's almost like... Uh, what's that those um like the native art with the bat like the uh like you did in a sense there there's a term for it they do um, ledger art ledger like Probably almost like a art. ledger type yeah yeah but um, even just cleaning up cleaning up the like the red and blue names on here and making it like making it more rel eligible uh, oh yeah 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 well readable. You know, and he had some lines in here and stuff, and it and it's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, how he kind of, you know, and he's from Grand Ronde, but yeah, the Western Oregon's a little more of a there's a there's a lot more going on in terms of these smaller groups in different areas, and um, but yeah, the east side, you know, it, you know, you see Nez Perce way over here in the corner, mm -hmm. um, you know, that in this beautiful valley, which I by joseph over here at that we're actually right here that right. little section that's to me one of my the most beautiful places in oregon it looks just like montana in that valley right like just how spread out it is and that's that was where chief joseph lived and they pushed them all into idaho you know and then other elsewhere but no exactly when you look at um, what, all these things get shrunken down but I guess when you focus more in here on the Middle Oregon Treaty, it's interesting too. Like you said, there's the it gets confused with the Treaty of Middle Oregon, but there's right. the Middle Oregon Treaty. Um, and it actually they had it had the articles. Um, mm -hmm. you know, like you said, it was uh, I have I have them all. I read them on the last one. I think I could read them here, but you yeah, know, it has the original signatories: Dog River, Wasco, Lower Deschutes, Middle Oregon, to Tainan. Mm -hmm the upper Deschutes, the Wasco, um, it become successor and in interest. So what it became is the Confederate tribes of warm springs reservation, uh, key provisions, railroads, roads, and highways, hunting and fishing, gathering provided agricultural assistance, right of way, provide educational assistance, provide healthcare assistance ratified. Um, did you know there's a new native apparel company? No, I did not. It's called shop LS five, seven, four. Named after the 574 federal tribes and the Little Shell descendancy of its founders. Wow, that's really cool, man. It is. 
It is becoming a spot to order native apparel by and for natives, working with native designers and teams to help best represent Indian country. That's awesome, dude. For sure. Now make sure to go pick up some a native podcast swag as well as other native gear while shopping at shopls574.com. Oh yeah, and do not forget to use code ANP10 to save on your next order. That's ANP10. Hey Matt, did you know there's a tribally owned net company? No, I did not. Not only are they tribally owned, but Blue Ribbon Nets also creates totally sustainable products. With Blue Ribbon Nets, not only are you getting quality nets, but even eco-friendly ones as well. That's awesome, dude. It sure is indeed. Make sure to use code RUGARU10 on your next Blue Ribbon Net order to save. Again, the code is RUGARU10, R-U-G-A-R-U-1-0. I am definitely getting a Blue Ribbon Net now. Tune in every Tuesday to hear your favorite native podcast. That's right. A Native Podcast has new episodes every week, ranging from boarding schools to Indian child welfare. Not only that, but we have Indian country covered from Maine to California and Florida to Alaska, Hopi to Blackfeet and Choctaw to Clinkett, and all those Crees in between. And all you other natives and non-natives out there, we want to remind you to tune in this Tuesday to A Native Podcast. Is your res runner in need of new lights? Well, look no further than our friends at Oxteo, an industry leader in LED lights. Make sure to use code RUGARU on your next set of lights. That's R-U-G-A-R-U. On June 25th, so coming up in a month from this recording, right. month, three days, uh, articles of the agreement and convention made at, concluded at Waskow near the Dalles of the Columbia River in Oregon Territory by Joel Palmer, Superintendent of Affairs on the, on the part of the United States and following named chiefs and headmen of the Confederate tribes of bands of Indians residing in the Middle Oregon. Uh, they, they being duly authorized, therefore, by their respective bands to wit, and I'm not going to say any of their names because I <laughs> will butcher all those guys, uh, but they are from the tribes mentioned. Article 1, above named Confederate brands of Indian seed to the United States, all their right, title, and claim to all part, all and every part of the country claimed by them, including in the following boundaries to wit, commencing in the middle of the Columbia River, at the Cascade Falls and running thence southern, southernly to the summit of the Cascade Mountains, thence along said summit to the 44th parallel of north latitude, thence east on that parallel to the summit of the Blue Mountain or the western boundary of the Shoshone or Snake Country, thence northernly al- along that summit to a point due east from the headwaters of Willow Creek thence west to the headwaters of said creek, thence, said, thence down said stream to its junction with the Columbia River, and thence down the channel of the Columbia River to the place beginning, provided, however, that so much of the country described above as is contained in the following boundary shall, until otherwise, directed by the President of the United States, be set apart as residence for said Indians, which tract for the purposes contemplated shall be held and regarded as Indian reservations to wit, commencing in the middle of the channel of the Deschutes River, opposite of the eastern termination of the range of highlands, usually known as the Mutton Mountains, thence westerly to the summit of said range along the divide to its connection with the Cascade Mountains, thence the summit to said mountains, thence southerly to Mount Jefferson, thence down to the main branch of the Deschutes River, heading into the peak to its junction with the Deschutes River, thence down to the middle of the channel, said river to the place of beginning, all of which tract shall be set apart, and so far necessary, surveyed and marked out for the full exclusive use, nor shall any white person be permitted to reside upon without the concurrent permission of the agent and superintendent. The said bands and tribes agreed to remove and settle upon the same within one year after ratification of this treaty, without any additional expense to the United States other than it's provided for by this treaty, and until expiration of the time specified, these said bands shall be permitted to occupy and reside upon the tracts now possessed by them, guaranteeing to all white citizens the right to enter upon, occupy as settlers and a lands, not included in said reservation and not actually enclosed by said Indians, 
provided, however, that the prior removal of said Indians to said reservation before any improvements contemplated by this treaty shall have been commenced, that if three principal bands to wit the Wakapom, Tia, or Upper Deschutes and Lower Deschutes bands of Walla Wallas shall express in council a desire that some other reservation may be selected for them, that the that three bands named may select three persons of their representative bands with the uh, superintendent of Indian affairs or agent, as may be him to be directed, shall proceed to examine and if another location can be selected, better suited to condition and wants of said Indians, that is unoccupied by the whites. And upon the board of commissioners thus selected may agree the same, shall be declared for reservation for said Indians instead of the tract named in this treaty provided also that the exclusive rights of taking fish in the streams running through the bordering and said reservations is hereby secured to said Indians and all other usual and accustomed situations in common with citizens of the United States of erecting suitable houses for curing the same also privilege of hunting gathering roots and berries and pasteurizing their stock on unclaimed lands in common with citizens is secured to them and provided also that if any band or bands of Indians residing in and claiming any portions or portions of this country in the article shall not exceed it to the terms of this treaty. And then the bands becoming parties hereunto agree to receive such part of the several other payments herein named as consideration for the entire country described as or said as shall be in proportion that their aggregate number may have the whole of Indians residing and claiming the entire country, Afro said, as consideration and payment in full for the tracts in said country claimed by them, and provided also that were substantial improvements that, that had been made by any members of the bands being parties to this treaty who are compelled to abandon them in consequence of said treaty, the sa same shall be valued under indirection of the president of the United States and payment made therefore in lieu of said payment improvements of equal extent and value options shall be made for them on tracks assigned to each respectively. Um, article two in consideration of payment for and the country hereby called see the United States agrees to pay the bands of tribes of Indians claiming the territory and residing in said country the several sums of money. $8,000 per annuum for the first five years, commencing on the first day of September 1856, or as soon thereafter as practicable. practicable. Uh, $6,000 per annuum for the, for, for the term of five years, next succeeding the first five. $4,000 per annuum for the term of five years, succeeding the second five. And $2,000 per annuum for the first five years, succeeding the, the third five. So it's just each money out goes down at about $1,000, a couple thousand dollars every uh five years all of which several sums of money shall be expended for the use and benefit of the confederated bands under the direction of the president of the united states who may from at time to time at his discretion determine what proportion of their of shall be expended for such objects in his judgment will promote the well-being advance them in civilization for their moral improvement of education for building opening and fencing farms breaking land providing teams, stock, agriculture implements, seed for clothing, provisions, and tools for other medical purposes, providing mechanics and farmers for arms and ammunition. Article three, uh, $50,000 additional to be expended on buildings. Article four, uh, the United States to erect sawmills, schoolhouses, to furnish farmer mechanics, physician, etc., to erect dwellings, houses for head chiefs, successor of head chiefs to take them. Article five then lays out lands may be allotted to individual Indians for permanent homes, uh, patents to issue thereof, conditions thereof, restrictions to not be removed without, etc. cetera. Uh, patents may be canceled. Uh, article six, annuities of Indians not to pay debts of individuals. Article seven, bans to preserve friendly relations, to pay for deportations, not make war, exempt, etc. cetera. Article 8, annuities to be withheld from those drinking liquor to excess, so they can hold <laughs> hold your money from you if you're drinking too much. Uh, roads to be made through the reservation came in Article 9, uh, when the treaty takes effect, and then everyone signed below.
So that's kind of the the, the, the yeah. gist of the treaty. <laughs> I didn't want to. I kind of was like, oh, I'll 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 give it the rundown on the other articles. <laughs> no, yeah, and it seems like um, you know we were talking about this earlier, but like there were some Walla Wallas involved with this. Some bands um, because the eastern edge there, because they're you know the town of Walla Walla, Washington. It's like it's out a little further east, but you know there were bands that of these tribes that moved up and down the Columbia river that interacted and spent time more over this way, you know, um, isolated groups, but. Right. No, exactly. Yeah. I, 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 the Tenino I like that you pulled up that, that, that map too, because that really did show that. Yeah. And it makes sense when you look at such a large land, right. All those different tribes are going to be, you know, like you said, like, yeah, sure. They may be like kind of cousins in that way, like extended yeah. family related, right. Maybe from the larger band, you know, mm -hmm. language group, the language group, you know, you look at like the Sioux out on the plains or some of these larger tribes, right. You're kind of out on the Oregon plains in that way. Right. Um, right. That Columbia plateau tribes. And that's why there's those four that are on the Columbia fish commission. Right. The warm Springs, the Yakima, Nez Perce and Umatilla. Right. And they're probably very yeah. similar. They all spoke the Chinook jargon, you know, mm -hmm. so it's, it's there, it's in the culture. Um, th it makes sense that they're put together, but people don't like, you take that 574 number and you really boil it, like you boil it up instead of boiling it down, right? You're boiling it up and it, uh, it shows, right? Like, well, each one of those tribes technically has six or seven tribes you know not all right. of them, all of them, but even like the blackfeet there's different bands within the confederacy right there's it's not just one the but Pecunni the one kind of is the larger whole yeah like the pecunny and the nitsapi or, or something you might know a little better but yeah like you like you're you're going you don't claim portland even though you live in oregon right no like it's no. that like you but you're all oregonians you know it's like yeah we're all black feet but i ain't i ain't from the river i'm up from the mountain you know like right. that kind right. of vibe yeah definitely all in good fun really it's the different like parts like you guys have a weird distinction between eastern and western montana and the people being a bit different like the mountain yeah. folk and the prairie folk and you know well i see and like when you look at the founding and this is getting off traffic but when you get up when you look at the founding of montana i think part of that goes back to like when you lived in sealy lake back in the 60s you didn't have tv you didn't have internet you had you know like so it was the rural remote that it was similar to wolf point right but now you're an hour with modern cars mm -hmm. outside of missoula you know that's a commute for some people you got the glamping experience down the road <laughs> yeah exactly exactly no that's good um did you have any other uh history that, not yeah. not at the moment um you know i think uh with this one with the warm springs being primarily involved i think uh you know it's interesting uh because you know there there were warm springs that were used as scouts during the Klamath Modoc wars in the lava beds down south there, oh. um, which was, which is created uh, apparently from what I've been told, some Klamath and Warm Springs people kind of, you know, they make jokes kind of similar to the Crow Lakota or you know, oh. what have you. Um, but it's just it's really all these things are out of survival. You know, I mean, decisions you have to be making and. Oh, yeah. but yeah no interesting history highly recommend the warm uh museum at warm springs and uh this summer checking out their resort canita when they open up so oh, yeah oh we'll have to do that uh and now we'd like to take you to music on a native podcast this week we have kalia jackson of kalia and blackwater i will always fight
And that was Kalia Jackson and Blackwater. I will always fight. Well, lastly, before I get into it, uh, I think this this Cliff Trazer, he's wide not. Uh, he he wrote an art an essay on Native American treaties in Northeastern Oregon. Oh, and I think this kind of this is kind of good. To, you know, kind of close up today uh, with these treaties. You know, uh, after American immigrants arrived in the Oregon Territory in the 1840s, representatives of the United States established policies for indigenous peoples in Northeastern Oregon. By that time, the government had owned its policies and protocols in dealing with native people, which included treaties, war, removal, concentration on reservations. In Northeastern Oregon, officials acting on behalf of the United States invited Indians to treaty councils, where they were urged to accept treaties and surrender much of their homeland. The government said treaties would prevent bloodshed with white settlers who are eager to resettle native lands. Under the terms of the treaties, people from many tribes secured themselves a minute portion of their former estates and lost valuable resources they considered to be part of their spiritual birthright, including land, fish, game, roots, berries, minerals, timber, and water. Uh, Congress created Washington Territory in 1853 by slicing up the northern portion of Oregon, which created a smaller Oregon territory 
made up of present day Oregon, Southern Idaho, and part of Wyoming. Mm -hmm. In late May, 1855, the Walla Walla Council was convened at Camp Stevens in the Walla Walla Valley where Joel Palmer, superintendent of the Indian Affairs for the territory, joined Isaac Stevens, superintendent for the Indian Affairs and governor of the Washington Territory, to negotiate treaties with some of the tribes of Eastern Oregon and Washington. After the dramatic arrival of thousands of Indians in the Walla Walla Valley in late May, Palmer and Stevens opened the council that would forever change the lives of the region's indigenous people. 2,000 men and women and children were set up set up teepees near the council grounds at Wayapatupu, the place of the rye grass, west, west of present-day Walla Walla, Washington. Palmer promised to protect tribal people with treaties designed to establish boundaries that would keep white settlers off reservation lands. He also promised to establish learning centers on reservations where Indians could be civilized in white ways. He would want to open roads and through Indian lands, and he claimed that commence and trade would benefit from Indians and whites alike. To accomplish these goals, Palmer and Stevens asked tribal leaders to sign treaties that would create Umatilla Reservation for the Walla Walla, Cayuse, Umatilla, and Yakima Reservations for the Yakima, Palouse, Piscusi, Clickitat, Wintachi, Wishram, Clinquit, Kawasasi, Liawas, Skin, Skinpa, Skaik, Okachot, Kamaltipa, I don't know that, Sipa, <laughs> and others, and the Nez Perce Reservation. <laughs> Treaties and reservations in Oregon. The treaty and council lasted many days. Palmer continued to continue, continually told the people that the government wished to protect them from unscrupulous settlers and to uplift them with permanent homes, hospitals, farms, mills, shops, and schools where their children could be assimilated. He offered food, goods, and money for sale of their land. He promised that the treaties would allow Indians to hunt, fish, graze, gather off the reservations in their usual accustomed areas. For that they listened patiently to Palmer and Stevens, the leaders included Nespier's chiefs, Old Joseph, lawyer, and Looking Glass, Palouse Chiefs, Calhouts, and Tilecox, Walla Walla Chiefs, Yellow Bird, Stickus, Five Crows, Young Chief, and Yakima Chiefs, Kamayakin, Owe, and Tias. When Native leaders presented their reaction to the to the proposals, they spoke of sacred of the sacredness of the earth and the ability, inability to sell the land that the Creator had given them. The creator had made all the earth. Cayuse Chief Five Crow said he made us of the earth. Uh, for Indians, le for Indian leaders, selling the land was a sin. Sictus compared the request to a person taking a nursing baby away from its mother and selling the mother, leaving the child without sustenance. He explained that the land is our mother. Young Chief reminded everyone that God instructed the earth, plants, and animals to take care of the Indians and told indigenous people not to sell the land. Yellowbird said that the proposals for the treaties and reservations made him feel like a feather blowing in the wind. The people of northeastern Oregon were reluctant to sell their land because it violated their religion, but they understood the political reality of the situation. Native leaders framed their views in spiritual terms, but they realized they would have to make agreements, asking Palmer what the president proposed in terms of money, goods, and boundaries. At first, Palmer proposed the Walla Walla, Cayuse, and Umatilla people live on the Nez Pierce Reservation. But, but Indian leaders from Eastern Oregon and Washington did not leave their lands. Then Palmer offered them a separate treaty in Northeastern Oregon and created, created the Umatilla Reservation. Although not enthusiastic, Walla Walla, Cayuse, Umatilla leaders signed the treaty in, in June 9, 1855, so right before this treaty of the Middle Oregon, right? creating the Umatilla Reservation, but ceding six and a half million acres of, of homeland to the United States. Over time, Nest Pierce, Palouse, and other indigenous peoples moved onto the Umatilla Reservation, often marrying tribal members. Several people relocated to the Umatilla Reservation following the Plateau Indian War of 1855-1858 and the Nest Pierce War of 1877. The U.S. Senate ratified the Walla Walla, Cayuse, and Umatilla Treaty on March 8th, 1859, establishing a nation-to-nation -nation relationship between the Confederate tribes and the federal government, a legal relationship that exists today. 
Then, not long after making that treaty, Palmer arrived down the Columbia River and met representative tribes of the Middle Columbia at the Moscow Treaty Council near the Dalles. Representatives of the Taino, Teague, Wyom, Dock, Spoose, and Wasco came to the council knowing that Palmer wanted them to surrender their lands and move on to the reservation. They met at Wasco Village on the south side of the Columbia, Columbia near Salilo Falls, where Palmer bluntly told them that he proposed a treaty to purchase their lands, extinguish title to their homelands and resources, and establish a reservation on the east side of the foothills of the Cascade Mountains. Palmer's proposal was were similar to those made earlier with the Walla Walla, Cayuse, and Umatilla Treaty boundaries, tools, assimilation through schools, hospitals, mills, farms, and teachers. He proposed to protect the people through treaties, warning them of dangerous white resettlers and hostile Indians. Chief Simon Tustitus of the Deschutes Band of Walla Walla Indians worried that people would lose their fishery at Salilo Falls and would not be able to hunt or gather. The basis of their economy Palmer told them they could fish forever, hunt, and gather off the reservation, a promise he included in the treaty. Even though the treaty guaranteed the Indians could fish at all usual and accustomed areas, state officials later would ignore federal law and arrest native, officials, native fishers. Chief Kickup of the Upper Deschutes of Walla Walla Indians agreed to move to the Warm Springs Reservation and go live where, where you have told us to go, I say in quotes. <laughs> He was happy to live near whites, he said, he, since he didn't feel that they would do us any harm. Wasco chief Tossumif did not trust Americans and wanted to be paid immediately for signing over his property, demanding, we want the money now. Palmer replied that he could not pay immediately, since government buyers could not purchase blankets, tools, and supplies for the Warm Strings people much cheaper than the Indians could if they purchased their good for traders. With an understanding that they would be paid later and receive all that they had negotiated, indigenous leaders agreed to move to the south of the Columbia River to the Warm Springs Reservation. Several native leaders signed the Wasco Treaty of June 25th, 1855, including uh, Simtustus, Loxquisa, Skikami, Kickup, Upper Deschutes, Walla Walla, uh, uh, the Tayano Band, the John Day River Band of Walla Walla, the Dallas Band of Wasco, the Kigal Walla Band of Wasco, the Dog River Band of Wasco. The U.S. Senate ratified the treaty and President Pierce signed it into law March 8, 1858 under the terms of the Wasco Treaty. The tribe surrendered approximately 10 million acres and agreed to move the Warm Springs Reservation with a land base of 4, 464,000 acres. The people lost land, resources, and fisheries, but until 1957, they continued to fish for salmon at their traditional fishing sites on the Columbia Rivers, many of them working from platforms hanging over roaring waters near Salilo Falls. Not all Native people affected by these treaties with them, and some refused to live on the reservations. The Plateau Indian War began in 1855 in the wake of the treaty councils. After miners found gold near Colville, Washington, whites violated the treaty agreements by trespassing on Indian lands near north of the Columbia River, raping Native women and stealing horses. Native people retaliated by executing some miners. Indian agent Andrew Jackson Ballone left the Dalles to investigate, but part of the but a party of Indians murdered him, triggering a war that put the U.S. Army forces in field to force resistant Native groups to surrender. Some Natives from northeastern Oregon participated in the war, fighted, and near the Columbia River and Washington Territory. Um, yeah. Always the discovery of gold, huh? Yeah, I thought I'd I thought I'd share that. That was just a little bit more. I like that. It was a good one explaining kind of a summary of everything. Oh yeah, he has it. He goes on further here. Um, but right here, I like this one. He he really talks about how each one of these the these acts helped. Um, Ness Pierce from right here, right. So in 1858, Native warriors lost battles at Four Lakes, Spokane Plain, and and most people moved to the reservations. In 1877, the United States again used the army to force the Ness Pierce onto a smaller reservation, then specified in the 1855 treaty. Some warriors from the Warm Springs and Umatilla reservations joined the Nez Pierce to fight against the United States. Although victorious in many battles, Nez Pierce, Cayuse, and Palouse lost the war in 1877. General William T. Sherman, commanding general of the United States Army, forcefully punished Native combatants in the Nez Pierce conflict, exiling them to Ekish Pa. 
at the hot place of Kansas and Indian Territory. In 1885, some of the warriors who had participated in the Nez Pierce War had been exi exiled to Indian Territory, returned with their families to settle on Umatilla and Warm Springs Reservations, where their descendants live today. In the 19th century, in the late 19th century, the people of the Umatilla and Warm Springs Reservations continued to live by the seasonal rounds, hunting, gathering, and fishing at particular times of the year, White resettlement of former Indian lands made this difficult, contributing to the decline and ultimate destruction of Native economies in northeastern Oregon. People on the Umatilla Reservation farmed the banks of the Umatilla River, but, but the poor and soil weather hampered farming on the Warm, Warm Springs Reservation in order to survive. The people adapted, supplementing their traditional practices by working for white farmers, ranchers, merchants, and government agents, and earning money as laborers, rodeo riders, dancers, artisans, and actors. Obsistently, to help Native people reformers in Congress pass the General Allotment Act of 1887, the act proposed breaking up the reservations into small family parcels or allotments on the premise that Native Americans would work for their allotments as far arms and join the market economy. Reformers and capitalists in the West joined hands to pass the act, while cattlemen, farmers, miners, entrepreneurs supported the bill because they believed it would open up millions of acres of Indian land for white development. Agents allotted lands on Indian reservations, including Umatilla and Warm Springs, which resulted in amount of Indian land that did not foster Native economic development. 22 years before the passage of the Allotment Act, Warm Springs Reservation Superintendent J.W. Huntington negotiated a new treaty, which diminished the size of the reservation but affirmed Native fishing rights. In further support of fishing rights in 1929, the government recognized Salilo Village, a seven-acre reserve on the Columbia River. The village is arguably the oldest continuously inhabited village of Native Americans in the United States, perhaps predating the Acoma or Orabi Pueblos. But tragically for the indigenous people of Eastern Oregon and Washington, in 1957, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers built the Dalles Dam, which flooded the falls and destroyed the most important fishery on the Columbia River. Destruction of this sacred site remains a significant and painful loss to people of the Warm Springs, Umatilla, and other reservations. The indignation of Salilo Falls was the most dramatic, consequential disruption of native fishing on the Columbia, but it was not the only dispute over Indian fishing rights in the Pacific Northwest after World War II. Congress passed the Indian Claims Act in 1946, which permitted tribal governments to file claims against the government for unauthorized theft of land resources since the establishment of reservations of the 1850s. Northwest tribes petitioned the Indian Claims Commission in the United States Court of Claims to re redress loss of resources. Tribes received small sums of money for their losses, but the government did not return land and resources. Nonetheless, a series of court cases included So Happy v. Smith in 1969, United States v. Oregon, 1969, United States v. Washington, 1974, confirmed the Indians' legal right to fish the Columbia and its tributaries. In 1884, Paiute Chief Oyotis led approximately 70 northern Paiute onto the Warm Springs Reservation, where their descendants live today. Other northern Paiute live on the Burns Indian Paiute community in East Central Oregon, which you pointed out. In 1885, Congress passed the Slater Act, which implemented land allotments in Midwest Indian Reservation and the Umatilla Indian Reservation preceding the General Allotment Act of 1887. Application of the Slater Act reduced Umatilla lands. In 1888, another act reduced the reservation with additional allotments, opening former reservations to non-Indians, reducing the Umatilla Reservation to 172,000 acres. On the Warm Springs Reservation, tribal members voted in 1937 to accept the Indian Reorganization Act, better known as the Wheels-Howard Act. By accepting the act, the people of Warm Springs re reorganized their tribal government with bylaws and a constitution. In 1938, the people adopted the name Confederate Tribes of Warm Springs Reservation. While the Warm Springs Reservation accepts the Wheeler Hauer Act, the people at Umatilla Reservation rejected it. They decided to create a nine member board of trustees, a general council, and creating their own form of government that exists today. In 1949, people on the Umatilla Reservation found that, found, followed the example of the Warm Springs people renaming themselves the Confederate Tribes of the Umatilla Reservation, although the Confederate Tribes received funds through legal action of the U.S. Claims Commission and Court, and Court of Claims, the United States government did not restore any lands or resources. So here's kind of the last one, dives into modern times. In 1977, the government of Umatilla Warm Springs, Yakima, Nez Pierce Reservations established the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. 
which ensured a unified voice to protect sovereign rights, to protect fish and fish and watersheds, support tribal management and scientific research, and educate people about salmon culture. Salmon remains part of spiritual life in Native peoples throughout Oregon, and many people part participate in the first salmon ceremonies in, tra in the traditional longhouse. During the 12th century, the confederated tribes of Warm Springs could no longer survive on traditional uh, on a traditional economy. So members worked at various jobs, and the, and the tribes sold lumber and established recreational sites. It built Kinata Resort in 1971 and added a casino in 1995, which helped fund housing, business developments, education, uh, edu cultural language programs. The museum at Warm Springs opened in 1993 with exhibits on tribal history and plateau Native American art and artifacts. In 1998, the Confederate tribes of Umatilla Reservation opened the Tam Skillet Cultural Institute with 45,000 square feet of housing on an archive library exhibits, offices, cafe, and program area. The tribes programs, resort, ho restaurant, wild horse casino employ thousands of people. The people of Warm Springs and Umatilla continue to meet meet in their longhouse to give thanks. The treaties and policies provide permanent homelands and tribal sovereignty for modern native nations of Northeastern Oregon. I like that. I, I, that was a really good article. I'm glad I read it. I, yeah, that was a, that was a really well worded one. Yeah. Um, he dove into the history of his people, you know, I believe. And it's, it's looking at that and understanding that like. Right. Nar. You know, here's 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 the treaty. Here's the things that affected the treaty. Mm -hmm. Here's the outcomes of that. Here we are today. You know, Columbia Re Tribal Interfish Commission, right? You know, comes from this treaty, right? Or comes from all the a combination of all these treaties. But right. this treaty is a part of that, right? So it's understanding these things, understanding where we as Native people exist, and it's just another treaty, just another one, number two. I don't know. Yeah. That's kind of it for me. I don't know if you got more. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yeah, it's, um, you know, in a major area with like folks coming West and the formation of the American West, it, it was a well-traveled area and region. And it just, at some point, you know, the tribes get the short end of the stick, <laughs> you know, and just like in the plains with the Buffalo, this one's more with the plateau tribe and the salmon. Exactly. <laughs> it's a similar story just different place different you know specifics of it but well yeah well and what's interesting too because like listening to it you hear the like the settling of the land because oregon was like go settle oregon right you know, the west was like go west go to oregon oregon trail right it was a whole yeah. video game basically the willamette valley the the mild winters and you know it, it, was, yeah, exactly. it was a lot of families and groups like in the Yellowstone series that their aim was Oregon, but some just stopped along the way and stayed like they stayed in Idaho or they stayed in, you know, potato farming or they did this in this other place. And well, that's the joke of Denver. They got to the mountains and they're like, fuck that. <laughs> Especially there where it's just like straight up. Like, right. Like, exactly. yeah, don't know if we're going past those. Well, do you have any final words for the listeners? Uh, check out the museum at Warm Springs and uh, Kanita. I want to say it's sometime in July, but so they're opening this summer and uh, adding some stuff. So uh, go support Warm Springs and and uh, you know visit if you're ever in the Dalles, Oregon. You you'll see that big dam and remember there was a big falls there one time. And natives still have platforms right below where the dams are there, but you know. Well, um, you, you know, you, you say those platforms, I, as a kid driving that highway, you always look out, right. You never knew really what they were. You're just like, Oh, it looks like people have wood. Just like, why is there a bunch of wood? <laughs> it's to stand on to fish, you know, and they, you've been there for thousands of years. Yeah. You know, add to them and replace the wood and, you know, cause it's kind of, they're kind of dangerous because they've, they collapse all the time. Like on the smaller rivers where you see them hanging over, like, Oh, oh yeah. Well, especially if they're not reinforced and built well. Right. Right. And not maintained, you know, if if people are messing with them, you know, non people. But yeah. About the fifty pound salmon in this net that's like twenty feet long and you're trying to like maneuver it. <laughs> Those nets are cool. Right. But 
anyway, yeah, get out there, visit some of these places and support, you know, the tribe and yeah, no, I like it. I like it. Good final words, Matt. Uh, I would just want to thank each and every single one of our listeners out there. Uh, if you're on the YouTube, if you're on the Spotify, if you're on the iTunes, whatever it may be, we want to thank you. We know you're listening. We get comments. Feel free to comment. Feel free to leave a review. Give us five stars. That helps us out. Please like, subscribe, add, share, tell a family member, tell your grandma, tell your sister. Tell whoever it may be, um, and we appreciate us. It helps us out. Um, we need it. We need the help. Um, but until next time, bye bye. I know, I know ballers, I know chiefs, I know riders from the east. I know educated natives down to pick it in the streets. Middle fingers to police. Fuck you, we come in peace. I know red skin hippies that be giving me the creeps. I know beauty, I know beast, I know savages and freaks, and I know a couple cousins even bougier than me. No, 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 ain't a leak. Bougie native, yes indeed. Art exhibit to the club, and we roll it twenty deep. Copper on my neck, gold on my ring, feather on my hat, skin stitch ting. Hundred warriors on my back, daily drumming when I sing. Man, there ain't no way around it. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a. a native podcast is produced by Gingy Advertising and Quartz Lake Productions.